Okay, so we are on Habakkuk for the third time. Um, we will be looking at Habakkuk's second response and the first part of God's second response. We're not going to look at all of God's second response because there's a lot to it. Um, in case you don't remember, just a little br brief recap. Habakkuk prophesied sometime before uh, Assyria fell to Babylon, so that puts it sometime before 609 B.C., um, Nineveh was destroyed in 612. So since God says, "Look and see," you know, I'm going to do these things that you, you know, didn't see coming. That kind of seems like maybe before the fall of Nineveh. So we're talking about probably like anywhere after 650 and anywhere before like 615 or maybe 620. Um, okay, and uh, let's see, we last week we looked at uh, Habakkuk's first. Uh, problem that he brought up, which was, you know, hey, God, aren't you seeing all these wicked people prospering? Why aren't you doing that? They're outnumbering as righteous people. And so then uh, God kind of gives this response of, oh, I'm doing something. You're just not going to like it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and so then that kind of brings us to this week. Uh, before we get going on that, let's just, uh, real quick um, discussion. It probably won't take too long here. Oh, it went by itself. Uh, people often think if God answered, it would solve everything. What do you do when God answers, but you don't like his answer, or his answer doesn't seem right? Like, what I mean by it doesn't seem right is like in Habakkuk, Habakkuk was kind of confused by God's response because it was so flabbergasting to him. He's like, I don't, I don't, how can that be right? Aren't you, wait, what? Kind of like, you know what I mean? It doesn't seem like something God would do. So what do you do? Um, when you don't like his answer or his answer doesn't seem what like something God would say. I want to say pray for understanding, but I don't know. Maybe pray that... God's will be done, and that you don't mess it up, since you don't like the idea. <laughs> I don't know. Like That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> Were you going to say something? <coughs> you guys have never prayed, and God just said something that you didn't like, like or answered in a way that you didn't want him to. That's never happened. Yeah. No? Yeah, I have. Oh, well, so what What did you do? What did I do? I, I basically did what he told me to do and prayed that I don't mess it up. <laughs> so you weren't joking. I got it. No, I wasn't. <laughs> got it. <laughs> I mean, because obviously he knows what's best, so I don't, I don't want to say I'm not going to do that, God, because I feel like... Something bad would happen if I say I don't want to do it. <laughs> okay. Really you will end up tossed overboard and swallowed <laughs> by a big exactly. fish. Exactly. <laughs> That's funny. I feel like, though, like when that happens, though, God's, God. God doesn't necessarily give me understanding, but he, he gives me... More of a compassionate heart, I guess. What do you mean? Like, gives me more of a heart of the situation. Like, what do you mean? It softens my heart. Yeah. Like, what do you mean? Um, like, what does that actually look like? Um, okay, for instance, um, after, after, after a little bit of living in Tularosa, I didn't want to live in Tularosa anymore. I, I kind of hated the place. Okay. And um, I, I kind of just wanted to move somewhere else. And um, God's, God spoke to me and said, you know, you're staying in Tularosa. And in fact, I'm going to give you a heart for the kids so when in the town. So when you leave Tularosa, you won't want to leave. And I'm like... Okay. <laughs> well, okay then. No. <laughs> Let's get hard for the city. So <laughs> you will stay and you will like it. Exactly. Yeah. No. And so now I I actually 
love to rest of mine. I don't want to leave it in. I, I feel like it's such a a place for me to grow and for other people to grow. So what do you guys think? You guys are just going to let Gracie take all the heat on us? I mean, he is God, and if you go against his answer, things are just going to be bad. So you can it can either be you don't like it, and it work out like he wants it, or it's going to be bad. <laughs> There's... My mind thinks of the different people who want to live their life their own way. And when you say something, they say, you know, basically, I want to do whatever I want to do. I'm an adult. Basically. I do what I want. And, uh, you know, that also kind of brings it to mind people who, you know, oh, I, I want to get closer to God. You know, I want to, you know, whatever. And then when God tells them to let go of something, they will, they, yeah. they don't really like that. Yeah. You know, they, they, they want God to get closer to them without them having to actually... Do anything. <laughs> kind of like, how about this guy? I'll do my thing, and you just make it all better. <laughs> you know, it's, I don't know if that's going to work how you think it's going to work. You got anything? I kind of have an example. Okay, go ahead. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was wanting to switch churches again. Okay. Uh, but just something told me, and I know I know this was God, just I needed to stay at Tulsa community I just because everything is become. And I was like, I don't want, I, I want to switch. <laughs> I, I want to get out of here. I don't like how things are going right now. I just don't want to leave. It's check, wasn't it? It was totally check. <laughs> yeah, it's it okay. Was, there were just things going on. <laughs> you know, I was just like, I want to leave. But I was her youth pastor at that time. So. Yeah, she's like, yeah, yeah, I just <laughs> want to leave. Youth, not you. <laughs> it was everybody else. So like, <laughs> I need to get out of here. But I was just like, you know. He's like, no, they're staying. <laughs> I stay in my mm. oh. But I end up staying. In yeah. And it works. How about that? <laughs> well, so when we look at Habakkuk, this is definitely a guy who was complaining to God, and God did definitely give him an answer he didn't like. And he kind of told him that he wouldn't like it either, because he was all like, you know, oh, these people really are as bad as you've heard. Like they, it's it's we're not sugarcoating it. Let me tell you about some of the things that they're gonna do, Habakkuk, and uh, <laughs> and uh, so then he does, and so then then have, we're gonna look at Habakkuk's re response. But just real quick, this is all stuff I I already mentioned. Dialogue between Habakkuk and God. I already mentioned that. Uh, so the prophet basically wicked go unpunished. God, I will use the wicked Babylonians. Prophet, they're worse than us. And God, the wicked will be punished. So Habakkuk kind of has this response to God, like, whoa, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're supposed to kind of resolve this issue in-house, you know. Do whatever you need to do here. Maybe if you just want to strike the wicked down, destroy them, whatever. And we can all continue to live our lives here, and and, and everything will be fine. And, and then God's like, no, no, you don't understand. I'm going to use those people who are much more wicked. <laughs> and Habakkuk is like, okay, hold on. I know that you're just and everything, so why why is this happening? So the main theme, obviously, God is in control. The wicked will be punished, but God will do do things his own way. Absolutely. Um, so then that takes us to Habakkuk's second response. It is recorded in chapter 1, verse 12, through uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Woe to him who... I'm sorry, that's not right. 
I'm in chapter 2. Sorry. Chapter 1, verse 12. I knew something didn't look right. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We will not die. You, O Lord, have appointed them to judge, and you, O Rock, have established them to correct. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Why do you look with favor on those who, who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they? Why have you made men like fish of the sea, like creeping things, without a ruler over them? The Chaldeans bring all of them up with a hook, drag them away with their net, and gather them together in their fishing net. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they offer sacrifice to their net, and burn incense to their fishing net. Through their, uh, through, because through these things their catch is large, and their food is plentiful. Will they therefore empty their net and continually slay nations without sparing? So, part of Habakkuk's answer is sheer terror. And you can kind of hear it in the things that he says. He's just like, okay, this does not seem like a good thing. Now, that, that would be the equivalent of, um, hey, yeah, ISIS is going to come, and they're just going to wipe out America, and you guys are going to be all enslaved to them. Uh, hold up. Uh, that's, that's very terrifying, God. How about we uh, pause that? That sounds terrifying. And... Uh, so then here he says, um, part of the thing that I like about his, his initial response is he, he takes that sheer terror and he just, okay, God, but you, you're obviously still in control here. Look at this. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We will not die. Okay, all right. You, O Lord, have appointed them to judge, and you, O Rock, have a subject to correct. So at the same time that, that, that this is terrifying for me, but this is not catching you off guard. And I think that that's kind of an important point, um, is that it, it, it wasn't catching God up. He, he said very clearly, yes, they are evil, but yes, I am the one raising them up. And then in verse 13, your eyes are too pure to prove evil. So he understands that God's the one working, but he, he still, there's kind of this little bit of a little tension between, you know, okay, but you're good, but this is this does not seem like a good thing. And you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Why do you look with favor? Excuse me on those who deal treacherously. Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they? And so the problem in Habakkuk's mind is not resolved. So you've got the wicked were oppressing the righteous. Well, now we have the more wicked are oppressing the less wicked. So that's basically the exact same thing. The issue isn't resolved. Um, uh, let me come back to that. Um, and so then verse 14, Why have you made men like the fish of the sea, like creeping things without a ruler over them? There's a few things that this is doing. First off, this is foreshadowing Jesus. And the way it is foreshadowing Jesus is something that Jesus says when he's looking out over the multitudes of Jerusalem. He says, you know, that they that they didn't have a ruler. They were just, you know, they were just like turds out there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so th this is something that Jesus is going to pick up on with, with Israel. And this is exactly what Habakkuk is saying about, you know, not just Israel but with the surrounding nations. And uh, so it does definitely foreshadow Jesus as, Jesus as the shepherd who looked out and saw the people. Um, but it's also it's also kind of a reference, if you're familiar with the Bible and Judges, it says that in those days there were no king, and everybody just kind of did whatever they want. And this is kind of a reference to that. that well, God, why are you allowing such chaos to happen? Why are you allowing to, for people to not have someone who's rising up to the occasion? Why are you allowing everybody to just set their own standards for what is right and wrong, and everybody's just okay with that? Because we already looked at that last week, that the Chaldeans, their source of, of right and wrong was whatever they said it was. They didn't have they didn't have some divine law like the like the Israelites did. So it was a reference to their wickedness. They all do whatever they want. Um, and But there was also kind of a complaint that there's no one who's leading the people in what is right. There's no King David that's, that's leading a nation. There's no, you know pillar of fire that's leading a people through the desert. There's no Moses who's leading people out of Egypt. There's no Joshua who's leading people into the kingdom. There, there, there's nothing. Everybody's just kind of... It just seems like there's chaos, and nobody's stepping up to do the right thing. And uh, it seems like they're just they're just out there roaming about like fish. They're just roaming in the sea and are getting caught in the net. That doesn't seem like this is what should be happening. Um, and then in verses 15 through 16... Uh, the Chaldeans, which, which who are the Babylonians? The, 
long story short, there there were different people groups who lived in Babylon, but the Chaldeans were the ones who were in power. So when they say the Chaldeans, it's talking about the Babylonian Empire, the Babylonian rulers. The Chaldeans uh, bring all of them up with a hook, drag them away with their net, and gather them together in their fishing net. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Now the imagery here is kind of, and I wrote it down there, worshiping and praising themselves in their power. The, the wording here, therefore they rejoice and are glad, it's kind of the idea of worshiping and giving praise. Um, and the idea here is kind of kind of the um, symbolism of worship, and that's kind of the point because as he, as he goes into verse 16, therefore they offer um, a sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their fishing net, uh, because through these things their catch is large and their food is plentiful. So they're worshiping themselves, they're worshiping their power, they're worshiping all their you know all their all their pretty tools and everything, all the all the stuff that they've conquered, and. Uh, so these are people who, who literally have no sense of right and wrong. Um, in fact, uh, the veggie tells Jonah, I like how I said, they're, these are people who, the fish lappers. <laughs> these are people, have you guys seen that movie? <laughs> the, oh no, okay. okay. Uh, will they therefore empty their net and continually slay nation without sparing? Is this something that's never going to end? And see... Habakkuk's ending question here is bigger than Babylon, if you notice. It starts pushing the context past because he's, he's already made it clear. God, this really doesn't fix anything because the wicked are still persecuting the people who are more righteous than them. How is that, how is that right? So the issue really isn't resolved. And here Habakkuk, um, Habakkuk is asking more than just simply Babylon's you know, prospering or Babylon being all powerful, he's kind of broadening out here to include will the wicked always prosper? And it, it really is just such a great way to end that as it goes into into uh, God's answer. And and the first verse of chapter two uh, isn't really a question; it's not really God's response. It's kind of in the middle. I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart, and I will keep watch to see what He will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. Um. Okay, I'll stop right there. Uh, so he, he's, he's earnestly uh, w waiting for a response. He's waiting to be shown how he is wrong. Look at this. And, I, and how I may reply when I am reproved. When God proves me wrong and shows me how, where, where, where am I... Because this is what he's saying. He's saying, this is how my thinking is, is imagining this, but I'm just waiting for you to show me how is my thinking wrong so that I can, you know, I can respond. Um, and then also the, the first part of that, stay, station, stand on my guard post, station myself on the rampart, the idea of constantly being vigilant. He is, Habakkuk didn't just simply ask God a question and let it go. He asked God a question and then he earnestly sought after God. Sometimes when we seek after God, we get this idea that we just kind of pray and then, well, that's it. But as we see in Habakkuk, it's not like that. When you pray, you keep praying, you keep seeking after God, and you keep uh, asking, you know, for an answer. You keep asking for God to do something. And uh, Habakkuk did not see himself as an equal voice to God, and knew that God had the last word. That's a very important point. Sometimes we think just because, oh Jesus, so therefore because Jesus has, you know, done this work and we're Christians now, we're not Jews. That somehow that makes it where it, it it's we're equal voices with God. You know, like God's my homeboy, and and and. And he's kind of responsible to give me an answer. Like, God, you I guess you should have known that that was wrong for you to have done that. Like, a lot of people feel like this about the whole uh, Canaanite genocide, you know. Well, God kind of needs to give an explanation. No, God kind of doesn't need to give an explanation because he's kind of God. that He can do whatever the heck he wants to do. Uh, so Habakkuk didn't see himself as an equal voice. That's kind of important. When, when you're praying and seeking God, even when you're frustrated, remember, God... Us. Just because God has um, stood in the gap to make us um, justified doesn't mean that in our exalted position that we are up here with God. That's not what that means at all. That simply means that we can stand before God. There's a big difference there. Um, and obviously God had the last word. It wasn't, oh, you know, Habakkuk, gee, I didn't think about that. You're right and I'm wrong. You know, I just, I guess I didn't have an idea of what was just and what was not just. You know, Habakkuk realized that. He realized, okay, I'm the one who's at fault with this. So that takes us to, to God's second answer. And I do want to say this before I get going too far. Part of righteousness is being satisfied in God, 
rather than longing after the satisfaction of the world. That's part of righteousness. You can't always try to be um, consumed with the world and, and pleased by the world and you know live your whole life for the world and still think, you know, I can still be righteous and still serve myself. Righteousness, by its very definition, has to be like uh, an abandonment of yourself to God. Um, so anyways, uh, God's answer is from verse 2 in chapter 2 uh, through verse tw uh, Well, actually, technically, it's all through the end of the chapter, which, well, actually is verse 20. We're not going to read that far. We're going to go to verse 5, I believe. Then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets, that the one who reads it may run. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal and will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it. For it will certainly come, it will not delay. So this is something I want to kind of important, because this is kind of brings up the question of fate. Was it something that was not could not have been avoided? First off, Israel was not fated to have fallen. So the punishment didn't have to come. However, at a certain point in time, God did say, yes, this is going to for sure happen. Nothing you do will change it. Much like Jesus' second return is going to happen. There's nothing you can do to change that. Um, however, um, there are some things that, that can be done. For instance, it says, though it tarries, wait for it. Um, that could imply, um, though God kind of pushes it back farther than it was intended. For instance, I believe it was um, Hezekiah. Maybe it was Solomon. You know what? I, I'm not going to remember. I, I don't really remember, so I'm not just not going to say. But one of the kings, um, he said, because, you know, I'm going to do this, but I'll wait until after your days because of your father. I believe it was Solomon. Um, yeah, I think it was Solomon with the divided kingdom. He said, I'm, I'm going to divide the kingdom because you, you started serving these other gods, but I'll do it in, in your son's reign because, you know, of your, your father David. Um, and... Uh, yeah. Just a few things here. First off, in verse 2 through th verse 3, it will come, it will be a warning before and a witness afterwards. See, God had a plan for this the whole time. So before, write these things down so that it can be a warning to people. But then, for the vision is yet for the appointed time, it hastens toward the goal and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come, it will not delay. So it, it's a witness afterward. So this is going to be a pro going to be a word that prophets before and after. Then we get to verse four. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right with him. Now pay attention to this, but the righteous will live by his faith. Furthermore, wine betrays the haughty man, so he does not stay at home. He enlarges his appetite like Sheol, and he is like death, never satisfied. What is missing from this? Did, did anybody catch it? From verse four, what's the important part that's kind of completely absent? Works? Okay, that's a good guess. That's not really what I'm what I'm going for. Uh, does anybody else have any other other guesses? No. You want to you want to throw your throw your in the ring? No. God does not specify who he's talking about. Did you catch it? He doesn't specify whether he's talking about the Chaldeans, evil people generally. Or the evil people in Israel. He never specifies. And there's a reason for that, I think. God is no longer just talking about the Babylonians. That's what I think, why he didn't do that, is because he's not just talking about the Babylonians. He's talking about the wicked people. What was Habakkuk's initial question? Wicked people prospering. So who's God talking about? Wicked people. See, and if you notice... I kind of downplayed it up to this point, but I kind of want to highlight it at this at this time. If you notice in Habakkuk's speech and Habakkuk's questions, there was a lot of pride, wasn't there? We are more righteous than they. Surely you wouldn't use them. Surely you wouldn't use them. You, you are you seeing Habakkuk's pride? Yeah. We're the Israelites. You can't do that to us. I am a righteous person. You can't allow this to happen. Are you seeing it? Now, let's look at God's response. At, behold, as for the proud one, as for the proud person, generally speaking, as for proud people, his soul is not right within him. Is it that? Come on in, fellow friend. 
Um, okay, so uh, God's no longer just talking about the, the Babylonians. And so here's the thing. Pride exalts itself. Faith trusts God. And I want you to kind of point, point out something here in verse 4. Um, his soul is not right within him. Uh, another translation could be his desires are not right within him. In other words, when a, when a person is prideful, their core, the core of themselves gets off track. See what I mean? When someone's delight is themselves, when someone doesn't listen to them, to, to only, I'm sorry, only listens to themselves. Um, so so uh, pride exalts the self, whereas faith trusts God. Whereas the wicked will live by their passions and their desires and their own ways of doing things and, and their own standard of morality and their own standard of what's right and wrong, the righteous would live in obe obedience to God's ways and find blessing and fulfillment in that. See, we think that we have to do all these things in order to fulfill ourselves. But that's not what this is. It says the righteous will live by faith. In other words, you may think that doing this or, or having this will make you more satisfied in life. But the truth is when you give that up and live God's way instead, you'll actually find true fulfillment. That kind of sounds ridiculous, and yet that's the way it is. It's kind of hard to explain, but yet it kind of it, that's there. So here we have, Behold, as for the proud one... Generally speaking, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. What is he telling Habakkuk? Don't be so prideful, buddy. Instead, live by faith. Trust that I'm doing something. Trust that I'm in control. Trust that I will do something. I will punish the wicked. They will they will be punished for, 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 not, for not obeying me. Absolutely. But you need to live by faith. See, the, 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 the clear contrast. And this is such a powerful answer because... God is talking to like seven different people all at the same time. He's talking about Habakkuk. He's talking about uh, Babylon. He's talking about the, the evil people in, in, in Judah. I mean, there's just so much stuff going on here. And uh, for every different person that would have heard this, it would have meant something a little bit different to them. I just think that's so neat how God can say the same thing. And any one person who hears that one same, same thing, it touches their heart in a whole different way. I'm not saying God's word means whatever you want it to mean. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you just, well, I think it means this, therefore that's what it means. But God has a way of talking in such a way where it, it reaches you where you're at. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like, I was reading in the Bible and I was talking about, I, I brought this up a couple weeks ago, I was saying something about divorce. Well, I've never, I've never been divorced. I didn't come from a divorced household, so it, was, it kind of didn't relate anything to me. But then, as I was kind of reading it through, I realized the thing that I, that I actually brought up about how... God doesn't want me to divorce people in the church either by, you know, oh, I giving up on them. You know what I mean? Do you remember when I was saying that? Yeah. So here, God was able to bring something. That's, that's not what it meant originally, but God was able to use, speak it to me in such a way where it meant something to me. So does that kind of make sense? Now, that's not what it meant, but he kind of spoke to me in something. See what I mean? I hope that that kind of makes sense. Anyways, um... Because we don't decide what the Bible means. We discover what the Bible means. However, the Bible is active and is very much so alive. And when you read it, there's just little things that has waves of popping out and smacking you in the back of your head. And you're like, ah, I didn't think it had anything to say about the situation, but lo and behold, it does. Okay, uh, so once again, part of righteousness is being satisfied in God rather than longing after the satisfaction of the world. So in verse 5, Furthermore, wine betrays the haughty man, so that he does not stay at home. He enlarges his appetite like Sheol, and he is like death, never satisfied. Uh, and then and there, he also gathers to himself all nations and collects to himself all people. So there's a few things. First off, when we are prideful, we always want more, but we're never satisfied. When we, tre when we rest in faith, we can be content with whatever God gives us. Like Paul said, I know how to live with a lot and we'll live with a little. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He'll get me through it. I'm okay. Um, but, um, okay. But with that being said, um, the, the Babylonians were kind of known as being alcoholics. They were kind of known for that. So as this applies to Babylon, furthermore, wine betrays the haughty man, the haughty man being Babylon, um, so that he does not stay at home. In other words, um, his, his, his alcohol has given him fa false confidence to go into war with the other with the other places. Um, he enlarges his appetite like Sheol, he, and he is like death, never satisfied. So as it applies to Babylon, Babylon is is always hungry for more, and they're never satisfied. 
Um, he also gathers to himself all nations and collects to himself all peoples. That's very much so what Babylon was doing, going and conquering, moving people around. Um, but once again, as it applies to a single individual who's immoral, people who live immorally, they, they always want more, but they're never satisfied. And I've seen it happen time and time again. If this, if God would just do this, if this would just work out, then I'd be happy. And then, you know, God does something and says, well, it's not enough. You know, now they need something else. It's like, it's like when you buy something off Amazon, you're like super excited about it. And, you know, a week or two later, you're like, okay, let's buy the next thing. It's just not, there's no lasting pleasure. And obviously, you know, there are things in life that, that are fun. Like, I like video games. I think that they're fun. But there comes a point that well, I was trying to actually talk to my nephew about. There comes a point when you have to realize my life is not video games. And you need to move on with your life. And I, I see, and I don't think that some of these kids are really getting that. I think that they're going, they think that they're going to live their whole life. Yeah. Anyways, anyways, um, so some translations say wealth instead. Furthermore, uh, uh, wealth betrays the haughty man. It really just de it just depends what manuscript you're looking at. Either way, it carries a very similar idea. Wine was all, all was often symbolic of wealth, anyways, so it's not really that big of a difference. Um, so if if it's wealth, furthermore, wealth betrays the haughty man, so he does not stay at home. He enlarges his appetite like Sheol, and he is like death, never satisfied. It still fits either way. Um, so Babylon, we're drunks. I already mentioned that. It, also, the wine could be metaphorical. We see this throughout the prophet, throughout different places in the Bible. For instance, in Revelations, it talks about them drinking the cup, you know, drinking the cup and stuff. So it, obviously, um, there could be some metaphorical ideas here. In which case, it could be power. The wine could be power. In other words, they've gotten drunk off their own power, and so they have false confidence to go out into the world. Um, another thing is pleasure. There, you know, just the abundance of, of, of pleasure that the Babylonians got to experience. I mean, Babylon was a gorgeous city. Um, it was a huge city. I mean, it was it was really something groundbreaking for the time. It was just not only that, but it was considered a holy city. It had a lot of uh, occultic or not occult. Well, yeah, uh, kind of cultic. Uh, tie-ins to it, so it was kind of important for that. Um, in fact, uh, Assyria actually destroyed Babylon, and after a while, they said, okay, that was bad. We've angered the gods, so let's rebuild Babylon. And so they rebuilt Babylon, and then Babylon rose up to defeat Assyria. It's like, you should have left it destroyed, guys. <laughs> you didn't think that one through. <laughs> Anyways, um, it could be riches, like our, the previous previously mentioned wealth. Whatever it was, it was resulting in them never being satisfied, and so they they go into the fight. So just a few a few things that I want to look at. We're going to stop there. We'll look at uh, 6 through 20 mm, the first week of July. Next week is the party, and the week after that is the documentary over the over at the, the youth building. Um, so just a few quick uh, final points I want to make. In chapter 1, verse 5, if you go back there, it says, Look among the nations. Look among the nations. See, Habakkuk was focused solely on the Jews. He couldn't see past it for, the, for his life. And what God was trying to do was he was trying to get Habakkuk to think more globally. You know, there are other people out there who are suffering. There are other people out there who have never heard of me. There are other people who don't know me in my ways. See what I mean? And, and Habakkuk was just so focused on, on what was happening in Jerusalem that it's like, well, that's fine, but there is a whole world out there. Look among the nations, observe, be astonished. I have something bigger than this little plaque of land that you have in your mind. So look past your own pain and, pain and your own nation. That's absolutely true. That still applies to today. You see a lot of Christians who are getting all caught up on, on arguments about walls and flags and nils and all these different things. And it's just like, yeah, it, we, as Christians, it's not our primary concern. You know, it's all going to burn anyway, so maybe not treat that so important and treat people a little bit more important. I don't understand how people can treat... Respecting a flag and respecting a nation with more with more love and care than they can treat people, humans. What does American freedom mean at all if there's no people to actually enjoy the freedom, right? I mean, how can you love a flag more than a person? That just doesn't make sense. How can you love guns more than a person? People are irreplaceable. Guns, I mean, eh, whatever. They'll probably think of cooler guns in the future, too. I mean, I have my sight on a few guns, too, but um, nothing that I can afford. <laughs> uh, but anyways, my point being, uh, you know, is it worth getting sucked into all these political nonsense divisions that people have made? No, it's really not. So you think there should be gun control, and you think there shouldn't. Eh, okay. Anyways, 
Have you heard the good news about Jesus Christ? Have you heard the, the what is it that the Mormons say? Have you heard the second gospel of the or a second? Uh, another. Have you heard another arrangement? <laughs> Anyways, uh, so God intended for the discipline to turn the wicked from their sin. Remember that. God, Lamentation says that God does not get joy from punishing wicked people, but this kind of points out here in Habakkuk, God intended for the discipline to turn the wicked from their sin. And did you know, from the point that Moses led Israel, now listen close, the, from the point that Moses led, led Israel in the 1400s until Babylon exiled Judah in the 600s, there was always idol worship in Israel. From the time of Moses and Joshua all the way th down through until there was until the exile. After the exile, as mostly there there may have been one or two people, but by and large there was no more idol worship in Israel. The exile single-handedly wiped out idol worship in Israel. Now, doesn't that kind of seem like a pretty good payoff? Something that God gave them hundreds of years to resolve was resolved within 70 years. Doesn't that seem like an okay payoff? No, yeah, but they didn't have to get their families destroyed. If they would have surrendered to Babylon like God told them to, they would have had taken their whole intact families to, to exile. So it would have been a win-win. Because they didn't surrender, because they didn't do what God told them to, their families ended up getting killed, and they ended up eating their kids. They did that to themselves. If they would just listen to God in the first place. In 70 years, God completely obliterated something that he gave them hundreds of years of patience to do on their own. Consider that. Just think about that. That's kind of a kind of a big point there. Um, so what good could possibly come from this? Well, the exile practically eliminated an idol worship. Why didn't God do it sooner then? Well, because he was merciful. See, on one hand, it's easy to say, oh, well, God, why didn't you just go ahead and do it and get it done with? But on the other hand, it's like, well, what, when God does finally bring judgment, then it's too much judgment. You got to pick. I mean, you can't condemn God for being merciful and for being just. I mean, pick something to criticize God for. <laughs> pick something to criticize God for and then stick with that thing. But then when he proves you wrong, be gracious about it and say, okay, God, I was wrong. Okay, so any questions on any of that? Ultimately, it's better to have this mindset. God, exactly what Habakkuk had. God, I know I'm wrong. I'm asking the question, but I know you're going to prove me wrong. Please, I, I'm waiting for you to show me how, how show me where, where I'm wrong, like you said in chapter 2, verse 1. Show me where I'm wrong. So, reprove me so that I can I can know how to respond. And, uh, and we'll see in chapter 3, Habakkuk's response when God did give his answer was, he wrote him a song of praise. That sounds like a, a pretty good solution there. So, okay, if there's no questions or comments, we're going to end it there. We're good?